Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, so my talk is uh, part of a project I've been working on for uh, 15 years now. <laughs> so uh, perhaps one day uh, it will become uh, something presentable. Um, I'm not yet quite there, unfortunately. Um, I've sent you an, a handout, a seven page PDF. Uh, and we'll try to be uh, rather quick so as to take uh, advantage of the discussion. Uh, no. no. Um, so, uh, basically the project is um, about turning these uh, well-known uh, problems with relations into an argument against their being uh, fundamental. So um, uh, the, the title is fundamentally, there are no relations. Uh, but then uh, to take a step further and explore what could take the place of relations um, and in that connection, um, explore different types of uh, structuralism. So the first section um, it lays out that uh, case. So by a relation, I mean something that both has a direction and imposes a structure. The usual um, explication or perhaps definition is in terms of adicity, of course, but adicity at least um, at least prima facie is a syntactic notion. And uh, we would also want to say that uh, there's a relation in uh, Narcissus case. Um, so whenever we have relations, we also have relational properties. Um, we have different types of derelativizations. So relational properties, um, arise by place filling, but then there's also um, quantification and uh, reflexification. Um, and, and one big problem of any theory of relations is to account for both the connections between the different relational properties arising from the same relation, but also for the connection these relational properties have to the relation itself. Okay, so this will uh, be important in what follows. But perhaps uh, before I get to page two, 1903, a relational proposition may be symbolized by ARB, where R is the relation and A and B are terms. And ARB will then always, always, provided A and B are not identical, denote a different proposition from BRA. That is to say, it is characteristic of a relation of two terms that it proceeds, so to speak, from one to the other. It must be held as an axiom that ARB implies and is implied by a relational proposition B. R prime A, in which the relation R prime proceeds from B to A and may or may not be the same relation as R. But even when A R B implies and, in this, and is implied by B R A, it must be strictly maintained that these are different propositions. So what I uh, call the problem of converses and um, what you all know uh, from, the, from the literature, um, may perhaps be understood as a way of making sense of this Russell quote. Um, so the problem is uh, that there's no way of making sense of uh, what he says here. Okay. More specifically, um, the admission of converses um, brings with it uh, three problems. Um, so that's already on top of page three now. An overpopulation um, of the world, um, an obligation to take arbitrary choices, and the danger of regress uh, once we want to account uh, for their uh, difference. 
Even more schematically, we can think about this in terms of a, of a schema. So that's now uh, the middle of page three. We have Othello loving Desdemona. And we may apply to this relational fact um, two operations. We may inverse the direction, so that's abbreviated by D, or we may inverse the order of the arguments, that's O. So by inversing the direction, we exchange the relation for its converse. Um, and uh, by uh, inversing the arguments, we uh, change the order or the structure of the um, relational complex. Now, the problem here is that we have non-identity on all four sides, but we have identity in the diagonal. So um, we do not want to distinguish between uh, the relational fact that Othello loves Desdemona and the relational fact that Desdemona is loved by Othello. Okay. Um, so um, the diagram commutes and this has to be explained. And um, the, uh, the problem is that um, or at least, no, okay, so, so why do we have identity if we apply one operation first and then the other, if both applications singly uh, result in something new? Well, the obvious and I find intuitive compelling explanation is that the two operations are not really different. That one is, so to say, the converse of the other or undoes what the other does. But if one is just un the undoing of what's, what the other is doing, then I submit not both features are equally fundamental features of reality. So either order is derived from uh, direction or direction is derived from order. Um, so my choice is that it's order and structure that explains direction uh, and not the other way around. I take this to mean that in some sense relations are not fundamental because um, the way I conceive of relations, they exhibit these two features kind of, um, in, in an equally important way. So some, one, a thing that is um, essentially directed but not um, essentially brings about order is not a relation and the thing that's essentially uh, structuring but not itself directed is also uh, not a relation. So going for uh, the priority of structure, uh, I try to account for relational truths in terms of structural properties. Now, the property of loving, or perhaps better, the property of being a namatory complex is structural in the sense that it bestows roles. Um, so by roles, I don't mean um, argument places. I don't mean positions. Um, I mean, um, roles people can can play uh, in um, in loving for example okay so these roles are uh, specific to the relation uh, and it's an essential 
truth about the loving uh, or the being an inventory complex that within that complex there's a lover and the beloved. So in Narcissus' case, um, that's the same thing. So Narcissus takes up both roles and um, we may still say that he loves himself in one capacity, as it were, and um, is loved by himself in another capacity. So Aristotle um, sa says interesting things about the doctor healing herself um, when she's um, both the doctor and the patient. Um, but in any case, the structuring is in terms of um, such roles. Now, the important uh, thing about the roles is that they're correlated. So that uh, mirrors the um, um, correlation of relational uh, properties. So to, to make sense of that correlation, I quite like the Leibniz way of going eo ipso. So um, the, the scheme would be Othello loves or is a lover and eo ipso Desdemona is loved. Um, I like this way of speaking because um, it brings out, in my view, the important fact listed under Romans 3, um, which is the identity of truth maker. So it's the very same thing that makes Othello a lover and that makes Desdemona beloved. But that thing stretches outside Othello and it stretches outside uh, Desdemona, it's their couple, their complex. And that complex makes this true uh, in virtue of being an amatory complex. Now, there may be another amatory complex. Unfortunately, there is not uh, that other amatory complex. But that other amatory complex will differ from the one that exists in making Desdemona the lover and Othello the beloved. So it's not just the complex being an amatory one that makes it true, but it's the complex being a specific type of amatory one that makes it true that uh, Othello is uh, loves testimony. Okay, so the question um, I find interesting, but where unfortunately I have not as much to say about um, than I would I would like to, is how um, we understand this in intrinsic structure of that complex. Um, once we understand that, I think direction is then not so much a problem. Direction can be seen to be a perspective on the structure. So the only difference between um, the use of loving to say of the complex that it's the complex of Othello loving the Simona and the choice of being loved by, to say of the complex that it's the complex of the Simona being loved by Othello. Uh, the only difference between these two is a difference of perspective. It's a difference of what we uh, privilege. Okay. Okay, but what about the intrinsic structure? Um, I think, or at least the way I, I, I think about it, um, aligns it or connects it with uh, the more general problem 
of extrinsic non-relational properties. So the, the, the structure of, of the amatory complex is intrinsic to it, but extrinsic to both its parts. But it's still not derivative from a relation between its parts. That's exactly um, what I try to avoid. I want to have structure first, relations second. So the relations between the parts, they should be due to the uh, intrinsic structure of the complex. So we have to make sense of the extrinsic non-relational. Um, now I'm not really able to do that, um, but I'm intrigued by um, its uh, popping up in, in different places. So one place of course is intentionality. So, if someone is looking for the holy grail, that's certainly an extrinsic property of uh, that person. But crucially, it's not a relation that person stands to um, the holy grail. It's very well possible to uh, look for something that does not exist. The same with negative existentials. The property of the world of not containing unicorns, it's an extrinsic property of the world. Uh, there could be an intrinsic duplicate of the world, um, which would not be all, but would be accompanied by a unicorn that somehow is isolated uh, from the rest. Okay. Um, so it's an extrinsic property, but crucially, it's not a relational property. So not containing unicorns is not standing in the not containing any relation to unicorns, uh, because there are no unicorns. And also, uh, not only are there no unicorns, I also think there are no proxies for unicorns, there are no absences of unicorns, there are no unicorn replacements. Um, so it's, it's just not a relational property. Okay. okay, so what kind of picture emerges um, here? Okay, so on page five, I have uh, three accounts of what it is to be a lover. Um, I go for the second as cashed out as the third. So the standard account is that to be a lover is to be an X um, such that there's a Y, such that X loves Y. Uh, while the structuralist, he would, um, characterize what it is to be a lover top down, as it were. Mm -hmm. To be a lover is to be the lover part of an amatory complex. Mm -hmm. Now, to be the lover part of an amatory complex, I think, is not, strictly speaking, a relation. So parthood is, is uh, special in, in many ways and um, in important ways similar to identity. But um, even if it were a relation, it would be a, what Russell calls a heterogeneous relation. And the heterogeneous relations are precisely those for which the problem of converses does not arise because they, for um, logical and metaphysical reasons, cannot have converses. Okay. Um,
but I, I mean, I'd go, I'd go even, even a bit further and just for the moment pretending that they are facts, which, which I find um, problematic, but for, for expositional reasons, assume that they are facts. So I would want to say that the very fact that there is someone who is a lover is the same fact that some complex is amatory. Okay. The complex being amatory means that it has a lover as a part. So when we talk about Othello and say of him that he's a lover, we're in fact talking about an amatory complex. Um, now we're not talking about any amatory complex in particular, but as it happens, there is an amatory complex uh, about which we're talking, namely the amatory complex containing Othello, Othello and Testimona as parts. Yeah. I think that's it for the moment. Happy to say more if there's time in the discussion. <laughs>